Shalom and welcome to Temple Talk. This is Yitzhak Rubin speaking to you from outside of the land of Israel this week. I had personal obligations to be outside of the land of Israel and uh, it's always very difficult for me to be outside of Israel, especially at this time. So much going on inside Israel, which we'll be talking about in a minute, but uh, alas, here I am. Uh, outside, far west of Jerusalem at the moment, and today is the 15th day of the month of Kislev. We're 10 days away from Hanukkah, and it is the 28th day of the month of November, uh, 2023. I don't think I said the Hebrew year, that's that's 5784. And this week, this coming Shabbat, we read Parashat Vayishlach. Uh, and he sent, and that is from the book of Genesis, beginning chapter 32, verse 4, com- completing, concluding chapter 36, verse 43, and we'll be talking about that very soon. A quick, brief uh, update of what's happening inside Israel right now. And again, I'm outside of Israel, and as closely as I'm following the news uh, from where I am and maintaining all my uh, connections with Israel, it's uh, it's very different being outside. Uh, I feel a distance that I don't want to feel. Um, but uh, so even hearing the news, it's it's sort of a bit of a remove, which is a very strange feeling, especially in these times where many of the hostages, well, many, Many of the hostages have been released and are being released. It's a trickle. It's a very, very um, cynical manipulation by Hamas. This uh, concept, which is being followed right now, of a 24-hour cessation of hostilities uh, for every group of of uh, hostages uh, taken by Hamas to be released to Israel in turn for... Uh, for uh, prisoners, uh, not prisoners, but people sentenced to uh, serving terms for terror, Palestinians serving terms for terror inside Israel, and the ratio of the exchange is three uh, Palestinian terrorists for every uh, Israeli hostage. Now, bear in mind that the hostages were, as we all know, taken from their homes uh, on the 7th of October, Um, innocent civilians were sleeping in their beds, were attending a a musical festival, etc., etc., meaning no harm to anyone. And, of course, the uh, Hamas uh, broke over the border with Israel and took, in in addition to uh, murdering uh, 1,200 Israelis in those 24 to 48 hours and brutalizing and mutilating and raping. Uh, They also took in some 240 hostages. And uh, so I think around 40-something hostages have been released at this point, Um, maybe a little bit more. Um, In addition, I think, I think in addition to that number, there have been some... um, Foreign nationals, for example, Thai, uh, Thai workers who are working in Israel, either in agricultural, either in agriculture or uh, in uh, uh, caring for elderly, um, were also released uh, over the past few days. Uh, the deal reached, very tentative deal reached between Israel uh, and Hamas through third parties was that uh, young people and elderly would be released first. And even with that, every day there's this, you know, a new, a new uh, a cynical twist by Hamas. Uh, they have not, they've, they've released parts of families that were taken, entire families or, or parents and children or siblings that were taken, and they've released uh, children without the parents, or parents with, with without the children, simply, simply in order to um, express their inhumanity, which 
um, we're all well aware of, you know, these this concept that especially the Biden administration uh, is very big on pushing is that Hamas doesn't represent the Palestinians, doesn't represent the Gazans. They're a foreign entity that uh, impose themselves upon the Gazans. Well, if we recall the cheering, celebrating Gazans when the hostages were first t taken into Gaza on the 7th of October, and they were cheering and celebrating and 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 uh, uh, torturing little children, Israeli children who were brought in, who were being taunted, and bodies uh, alive and dead of 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 uh, Israelis that were loaded up on a truck, who were being beaten with sticks and, and jeered at and cheered at and spit on. These are the Gazans. These are it's not Hamas. These are the Gazans. And why I mention that now is because footage of the Israeli hostages uh, on a Red Cross uh, vehicle being taken out of Gaza yesterday, they were also uh, being jeered and, and attacked by Gazans, innocent Gazans, right? They're not, you know, what the big, the big question now, the big, the big heartache of, of the West is that so many innocent Gazans have been killed. Well, we have no idea how many innocent Gazans have been killed because the only information being handed out to the media is by Hamas. And Hamas, of course, loves to feed information to the West because they just eat it up as if it's truth. So they claim that over 10,000 innocent Gazans have been killed. Uh, there's no reality to that number. And they, of course, include their soldiers, uh, their soldiers, their terrorists as, as innocent Gazans. So this concept that that there is a, uh, you know, while Israel has the right to uh, pursue Hamas, Israel has to tiptoe around the Gazans and any death uh, of a, quote, innocent Gazan caused by, by Israel is reason for a cessation of all hostilities and uh, it's a crime against humanity. And of course, any cessation of hostilities will be a victory for Hamas. So Israel has vowed uh, that these ceasefires, uh, these temporary uh, cessation of hostilities uh, will not uh, be endless and that Israel will pursue and destroy Hamas. But again, as joyful as we are, and we are, and it's just so beautiful to see families being reunited. Uh, as joyful as we are, there are still many hostages still being held. Uh, we know that some of them are in very, very uh, serious uh, health conditions. An 84-year-old woman who was released yesterday uh, was immediately uh, taken to the hospital in very, very serious conditions. She's still in very, very serious life-threatening conditions. She was on medication, which has, she has been deprived of for the past uh, 40 days or more. So this is Hamas, they're evil. And this is the reality. And like I said, why we are very, very, very thrilled to see uh, our people um, being released from ca captivity and returning home. There's still many people in captivity and there's still a job to be done. And there's still a terrorists to be to be killed and destroyed and a population to be subdued, yes, subdued and taught a lesson and taught a lesson, the beginning of a lesson that must be taught and must be taught harshly because that's the language that's understood there hasn't been any uh, anyone in Gaza you know, protesting and saying how awful Hamas has been and now that they're and now that uh, they have some freedom because Hamas is being pursued, they're not rising up and uh, rebelling against Hamas. So maybe they're terrified. I don't know. That doesn't concern me. I'm sure there are some decent people in Gaza. I'm sure there are some very innocent people. I don't uh, deny that. But the idea that there's an entire population that... Uh, cannot be held accountable for the people that they elected and put into office to rule them. Uh, they chose them. They chose them and 
they have not uh, at any point uh, neither spoken out against Hamas rule nor behaved in any way that would uh, indicate that they had any problem with being ruled by Hamas. Until now, of course, when Hamas rule has turned out to be a death trap for them. But uh, it's a little too little too late. So that's what's happening. Uh, the uh, army is itching to get back into action and the people are uh, itching to see them back in action and the uh, government dare not veer from this course because Hamas must be destroyed. Okay, this week's parsha, Vayishlach. And um, let's read the first few verses in Hebrew, then in English. Again, we're in the book of Genesis, chapter 32, uh, verse 4. Vayishlach Yaakov mal achim lafanav el esav achiv, arza seir sede edom, vayat savotam lemor, ko tomrun laodoni leesav, Ko ama avdecha Yaakov im lavan gati vaechar adata. Vayhi lilisho vachamo tzon veever veshivcha veashlach lahagil adoni limtzochin veenecha. Vayashubu hamalachim el Yaakov lemo banu el achicha el esav vagam olech likratcha vaarba meot ish imo. Vayira Yaakov Maor Vayetzelo Vayachatz et ha'am asher ito et ha'tzon v'et ha'bakar v'hagmalim lishne machanot. Okay, in English it reads like this. Yaakov sent angels ahead of him to his brother Esav. Angels, uh, Malachim in Hebrew, can also mean messengers. So we don't know if we're really talking about angels or messengers. I think messengers is a uh, the... Shot. That is the simple explanation because it were scouts to check out what was going on. Yaakov sent messengers ahead of him to his brother Esau to the land of Seir, the field of Edom. And he commanded them saying, So shall you say to my master, to Esau. Note that Yaakov refers to Esau as, ma- as his master. Uh, this whole episode involves Yaakov um, being very obsequious to his brother he wants to placate his brother because the last time he was with his brother, his brother wanted to kill him. And this is some 20 years later, and Yaakov doesn't know if uh, Esav has gotten over it yet. Gotten over the fact that uh, Yaakov uh, received the blessing from Yitzchak, their father, that Esav felt that he deserved. And he commanded them, saying, So shall you say to my master, to Esav, Thus said your servant Yaakov, I have sojourned with Lavan, and I have tarried until now. And I have acquired oxen and donkeys, flocks, manservants and maidservants, and I have sent to tell this to you, my master, to find favor in your eyes. The messengers returned to Yaakov, saying, We came to your brother, to Esav, and he is also coming toward you, and four hundred men are with him. Yaakov became very frightened and was distressed. So he divided the people who were with him and the flocks and the cattle and the camels into two camps. So this whole opening of Parshat Vayishlach, and Vayishlach means and he sent, as in and he sent angels ahead of him. The whole opening chapters, verses, uh, are about Yaakov's preparation for meeting up with his brother Esav. And uh, his preparations include prayer include preparation for war and include giving gifts, presenting gifts to his brother. And uh, his prayer, of course, is very, very beautiful. And it begins in verse 10 of that same opening chapter. And Yaakov said, O God of my father Avraham and God of my father Yitzhak Hashem, who said to me, Return to your land and to your birthplace, and I will do good to you. Right? This is referring to the the encounter he had with, with Hashem in his dream, and after his dream, uh, in Beit El, on his way out of Israel, way out of the land of Canaan, uh, in flight from his brother. And I continue now, verse 11, I have become small from all the kindnesses and from all the truth that you have rendered your servant. For I, for with my staff I crossed this Jordan River, and now I have become two camps. 
Now deliver me from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I am afraid of him, lest he come and strike me and strike a mother with children. And you said, I will surely do good with you, and I will make your seed as numerous as the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted because of multitude. So again, he's, he's reminding Hashem, uh, or perhaps reminding himself of Hashem's promise, and he's counting on it, and he's asking for it again. Um, you may say, you know, he knows that Hashem promised him it all, so why should he be afraid? Perhaps it's too much to ask of a, of a human to not have fear, even in, in a situation, uh, confrontation that he was expecting, anticipating. And again, we can't rely on a miracle. We do need to always prepare for, for whatever the situation demands. And if it's going to be conflict, we need to prepare for war. And in this case, of course, as I said, Yaakov prepared for war by praying. This is the prayer. Um, and by preparing for, for combat, the way he broke up his, his family and his encampment into different, uh, different groups so that one was attacked, the other could, uh, could flee or counterattack. And uh, thirdly, by many gifts that he was presenting to Esav in order to placate him. And so he was fully prepared. And again, you know, we know that from... Uh, from the time of Avraham, he also was involved in a war, a war not uh, a war that was imposed upon him, and he also uh, entered that war in order to free captives. Very reminiscent of of our situation today, and in this case also, you know, when Yaakov mentions, he's praying to Hashem, uh, "I'm afraid lest he come and strike me and strike a mother with children." Wow, that resonates. Strike a mother with children. So, of course, in the end, Esau did none of these things. There, when they finally did meet up, they embraced and hugged and kissed and all was well. Uh, there is a midrashic understanding that that uh, Yaakov's uh, that Esau's kiss on Yaakov's neck was uh, intended to be uh, biting into his neck, but Hashem turned uh, Yaakov's neck into marble and broke Esau's teeth. And one reason for that uh, Midrash is the continued uh, enmity between uh, the children of Yaakov Yisrael and the children of Esau, the nation of, uh, of Edom. And of course, in uh, later times, Edom uh, became associated in rabbinic tradition with Rome and with the West. So, uh, there was a reason for the hostility displayed toward Esav in our interpretations of their of their meeting, although, as I said, the actual confrontation was very peaceful and they had nice things to say about one another. And uh, in fact, Yaakov said, "Take my blessing." And was he referring to the blessing that that he had received that uh, Esav had wanted? I don't know. You know, it's not. Uh, we can we can think about that, but certainly he, upon meeting uh, Esav, was greatly relieved, and was was being very generous to his brother, uh, Esav. Uh, uh, the actual physical gifts of of uh, livestock that Yaakov presented him, Esav, refused, but Yaakov uh, insisted, and, and Esav accepted it, and they went on their separate ways. Now, of course, before any of this. While Yaakov was still preparing to meet his brother and had already sent his family and had brought his family and, and his camp, encampment and, and all his possessions across the Jabbok, the Abok River, which is a, a, a tributary uh, of the Jordan River. He had already brought them across into the land of Israel, Canaan, and then he went back and was alone for the night. And of course, you know what I'm referring to. It was his nighttime confrontation with an angel. Now, very interestingly, uh, before I said that the word used to to describe the messengers that Yaakov sent ahead of him 
to seek out Esav were referred to in Hebrew as Malachim, which can mean messenger or angel. Malach is an angel, which is a messenger. An angel is a a spiritual or you know a spiritual being and a a, a a an energy, a spiritual energy that Hashem sends on a mission. And every angel has a single mission, and once accomplished, the, the angel the angel disappears. But the word Malach is angel. Now here, we read in chapter, in, in verse 25, and Yaakov was left alone, and it says, Vayavek ish imo. It doesn't say Vayavek Malach imo. It says a man wrestled with him until the break of dawn. Now again, we understand this to be an angel, which uh, by the end of the story, uh, just a few verses later, seems to be uh, the only option. Uh, first of all, what man would wrestle with Yaakov? And then, again, it says, when we get to the conclusion, we'll see why this is so clear. When he, the angel, saw that he could not prevail against against him, against Yaakov, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Yaakov's hip became dislocated as he wrestled with him. And he, and he the angel, said, let me go, for dawn is breaking. But he, Yaakov, said, I will not let you go unless you have blessed me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Yaakov. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Yaakov, but Israel, Yisrael, because you have commanding power with an angel of Hashem, with an angel of God and with men, and you have prevailed. And Yaakov asked him and said, now tell me your name. And he said, why is it that you ask my name? And he blessed him there. And so he never did tell his name. Yaakov named the place, as we learn in the next verse, Peniel, for he said, I saw an angel face to face and my soul was saved. Okay, so Yaakov had this nighttime confrontation. The question is, why did he go back? What was he, why was he going back in the first place? It's not answered by the Torah. Again, there's different uh, rabbinic uh, understandings, midrashic understandings of why he went back. Uh, we're not going to talk about that at this time, but he did go back and he wrestled all night with an angel. Now, this, this is such a, a beautiful story here that there are so many interpretations. Was he wrestling with himself? Was he wrestling with his conscience? Was he wrestling with a, an actual angel? And when the angel says, you have, you have wrestled with, with God and with man and you have prevailed. And again, the, the word Yisrael is, is, is based on the, the, uh, on that notion that Yisrael is, is he wrestles, he wrestles with God. That's what the name Yisrael means. And it's a very fitting name, I think, for our nation because we do wrestle with God. Uh, not in a hostile, God forbid, way, but we wrestle with God. We wrestle to understand what God is asking of us. We wrestle with ourselves to to be the best we can, to, to do as God commands us. We wrestle with man uh, in order to try to, to bring Hashem's light and knowledge to the world and to benefit humanity. But yes, we wrestle with, with God, and um, in that wrestling, we gain our identity. That's exactly what happened here. We gain our identity. We become who we are as human beings, as individuals. Uh, God, uh, he's, he's not asking us to be passive sheep. He wants our response. He wants our pushback, as it were. He wants us to, to stand up before him. Again, not, uh, not in confrontation but um, to assume our roles and our responsibilities because he is giving us responsibilities. He is, he is, he is, I um, can't think of the word I want to think of right now, but he is giving us responsibilities that were, would otherwise be his responsibilities. He's delegating responsibilities, that's the word. And so we need to stand up and we need to show that we are capable and worthy. And in order to understand um, our role, we need to wrestle with Hashem. And, uh, you know, we we wrestle by searching out uh, God's Word, by studying God's Word, by trying to understand what He is asking of us. And 
you know, sometimes by pushing back. And you push back and and God pushes back. This is what Avraham did when when Hashem said, I'm going to share with Avraham my plans for Sodom, for the city of Stom, that he was going to destroy because of the evil people in Stom. And he shared with Avraham, and Avraham said, well, what if there's 50 righteous people? What if there's 45? We know that story. Avraham was wrestling with Hashem. He was pushing back. He was forging a a more intimate uh, relationship with Hashem, and that's what happens when we when we wrestle and grapple with with Hashem and grapple with with the Torah and grapple with what uh, what Hashem is asking of us. And as with Yaakov, he uh, prevailed, but uh, with a limp because the angel had injured him in his thigh. So yes, we don't necessarily come out of our wrestles wrestling with Hashem uh, intact. We are also bear the mark, bear the injury of our struggle with our, our struggle with Hashem and, and with uh, what He's asking of us, but uh, that's being human. That's, that's what it's all about. I believe that's what uh, Hashem truly truly expects of us. Following the entire episode with Esav, and after Esav goes his way, leaves the land to head to Mount Seir, we arrive at the next scene in Yaakov's life. And, you know, Yaakov, when he returned to the land of Israel, uh, he was kind of expecting, a, you know, a quiet life. He had earned, he had worked hard for 20 years, he had earned much, he had he had developed a flock and herd of his own. He came back a man with much, much wealth and possessions, and he was expecting a peaceful time in the land, and it was anything but. It was one trouble after another, which would pursue him for the rest of his life, as he eventually would tell uh, Pharaoh when he was in Egypt toward the end of his life. And he said, um, I've had a tough life. I've just had one trial after another. So, now we're reading in, in Genesis chapter 34, verse 1. And tell me if this doesn't uh, ring a bell. Dina, the daughter of Leah, whom she had borne to Yaakov, went out to look out, look out among the daughters of the land. Now, I have to preface this. Yaakov has just... Uh, let's just go back. We'll go back a few verses. Okay, so again, the conclusion of his confront of his meeting with Esau. So Esau returned on that day on his way to Seir, and Yaakov traveled to Sukkot and built himself a house, and for his and for his cattle he made booths. Therefore he named the place Sukkot, which means booths. And Yaakov came safely to the city of Shechem, uh, also known today as Nablus, a name, uh, a Arabic uh, uh, pronunciation of a name that the Romans gave that city, ne Neapolis, a new city, they called it. And Yaakov came to the, safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, Canaan, when he came from Padanaram, and he encamped before the city. And he bought the part of the field where he had pitched his tent from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for a hundred ksita. Ksita is a, was a, a coin. And then he, there he erected an altar, and he named it God is the God of Israel. Okay, so he arrives outside of Shechem, pitches his tents, and purchases land. That land that he bought for a hundred kasita is the land that his son ya Yosef, Joseph Yosef, would eventually be buried upon. And, and Kever Yosef, the tomb of Joseph, which Jews pray out to this day, is on that land. And we know that Yosef, of course, died in Egypt, but before he died, he, he had his brothers swear that when they left Egypt, they would bring his bones with them, and they did. Uh, Moshe made sure to bring the bones, and we read even in the book of, of Joshua that they buried him uh, on that place, in that place outside of Shechem. And uh, this is a, one of the three pieces of land recorded in our Tanakh, in our scripture, that uh, the Jews, Israel, purchased 
from the locals. And of course, the first is is uh, Machpelah, the cave of Machpelah in the Hebron, where Abraham and, and Sarah and Yitzchak and Rivka and Yaakov and Leah are all buried. The second is this, the plot of land outside of Shechem, where Yosef is buried. And the third, of course, is the Temple Mount, Har Moriah, which King David purchased from from the Jebusites. It was his threshing field, and King David purchased it. And that is also recorded in the book of Samuel, and again in the book of of uh, Chronicles. So these are three indisputable plots of land that Israel purchased. However, ironically, of course, they are all in the the the, the most disputed places, uh, simply because they are so precious to Israel. Okay, let's go back to what I began before, uh, the beginning of chapter 34, Dina, the daughter of Leah, whom she had born to Yaakov, went out to look among the daughters of the land, and Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hevite, the prince of the land, saw her, and he took her, lay with her, and violated her. He raped her, and his soul cleaved to Dina, the daughter of Yaakov. He loved the girl and spoke to the girl's heart. And Shechem spoke to his father, Hamor, saying, Take this girl as for me as a wife. And so this begins the uh, negotiation. It says, next, Yaakov heard that he had defiled his daughter, Dina, but his sons were with, with his livestock in the field, and Yaakov kept silent until they came home. So Hamor and Shechem uh, go to Yaakov, and they say, uh, Shechem says, my son has fallen in love with your daughter, Dina. Let's let's make a deal. Let's let them marry. Let's join our peoples together. You can marry our daughter. Your sons can marry our daughters, and our sons can marry your daughters. And they will share land, we'll share property. And by this time, of course, the sons of Yaakov are all there and they're all part of this negotiation. And they are not very pleased. But uh, as we see in verse 13, thereupon Yaakov's sons answered Shechem and his father Hamor with cunning. And they spoke because after all, he had defiled their sister Dina. Right? What are we talking about here? They took Dina without her father's consent, without her consent, they raped her, and now they want to marry her. And they, the sons of uh, Yaakov, said to them, we cannot do this thing to give our sister to a man who has a foreskin, for that is a disgrace to us. Right? As we know, the Israel, the Jews, are all circumcised, and they're saying to, to Shechem and Hamor that, yeah, you want to get circumcised? We'll make a deal. And they agree to it, and they go back to their city, Shechem, and they can convince everybody in the city to agree to this. And so then, to cut to the quick here, no pun intended, so they did. They all became circumcised. They all got circumcised, and then we read in verse 25, now it came to pass on the third day, when they were in pain, that Yaakov's two sons, Shimon and Levi, Dina's brothers each took his sword and they came upon the city with confidence and they slew every male. And Hamor and his son Shechem they slew at the edge of the sword and they took Dina out of Shechem's house and left. Yaakov's sons came upon the slain and plundered the city they had defiled their, that had defiled their sister. Their flocks and their cattle and their donkeys, whatever was in the city, whatever was in the field, they took. And all their wealth and all their infants and their wives they captured and plundered and all that was in the house. Thereupon, Yaakov said to Shimon and Levi, You have troubled me to discredit me among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and among the Perizzites, and I am few in number, and they will gather against me and attack me, and I and my household will be destroyed. And they said, Shall he make our sister like a harlot? You understand what's going on here? It's happening. This is what happened to Israel on the October 7th. Rape, murder, mutilation, hostage-taking, and... You can argue about it all you want, and you can take the side of, well, you know, we can't overdo it because uh, everybody's going to be mad at us. Or you can just say, you just don't do this thing. You cannot do this and live to tell about it. And that was the response of the sons of, of, of Yanko. And uh, I think I'm running over here. I've got to go. Thank you so much for being with me. Temple Talk.